Hello. Oh, welcome to another episode of the Super Data Brothers Super Show. That's right. I am Ryan. And I am Eric. And we are real life brothers. It's true. Who work in the data and analytics industry. And do we have a good one for you today? What's on tap, Eric? Well, we've got a few things on tap. Like usual, we have, you know, a few news items, you know, maybe a Ryan's rant, maybe something like that. Uh, talk about AI, LLM, the latest in all the uh, AI and BI and every kind of Every ending I. an eye thing, any yep. kind of eye. We've got an eye on all the BIs and AIs. And, uh huh. I, don't think of, I can't think of any other eyes. But. And then. Yeah. And then we've got a, uh, yeah, an interview with Christoph Hein. We're going to be talking about uh, TM1, uh, planning analytics, same thing. Yep. No, we can also discuss the name change and how, how uh, if, if that was useful at all. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get deep into that. Uh -huh. uh, let's give a couple shout outs. So we got Cognos Paul calling in from Israel. Uh, good to see you as always, Paul. Uh, and then Chris Tab, friend of the show, former guest, Chris Tab. Uh, Chris, it's impossible to say where Chris is calling in from. The man travels. Let me tell oh, you. He's, yeah. Uh, go to his LinkedIn. You'll see the, <laughs> every conference in existence. Our, our man, Chris is there. Uh huh. He's, he's prowling the mean data streets. Keeping you us, you keeping just can't keep a tab on him. <laughs> waka, waka, waka. All right. Waka, waka. Now let's uh, let's get into today's show. So um, yeah, and also, and we're, 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 yeah, we're, one we're, more wait, exciting wait, thing to announce: wait, uh, we have a sponsor today for the show. Our first ever sponsor. It's like we're growing exciting. up. We're a real show. Okay, um, so we'll get to that in a second. Uh, why don't we kick it off with today's super data show? All right, uh, Bob, welcome. Calling in from Vancouver. Hi from Germany. We've got an international fan base here at uh, Super Data Brothers. Uh huh. Okay, so uh, Eric, why don't you tell us the news? All right, I think I will. So I I follow the LLM and the AI stuff a bit more than Ryan, especially on the open source end, because I think, as we said on the show before on that episode with Miko, I think that's where the future is. Yep. Right. And as we talked about on that show, like the current open source king is is Meta's uh, Llama. Right, because you know, partially because it leaks, so people could just use it, and then like after that, you know, Meta threw up their hands, like, okay, this is our strategy. But it seems to be working for them because that's the entire open source, you know, all the open source models are basically based on Llama. So news about that, Meta, Facebook, is uh, the launching launching their new Llama two or whatever they end up calling it, you know, including code, images, all that sort of stuff, and they plan on keeping it open source, right? In order to, you know, exactly they, what you said they were going to do. This I, I, I called this out that this is what they're going to do. And like, lo and behold, this is what they're do, They're going to do, right? Yeah. You know, and that they're going to keep, um, I, I, no one knows how they're going to do the commercial licensing or how that's going to work. You know, maybe if you want to do it commercially, you have to go through Meta. I mean, probably. Um, or if they're going to have alternate commercial license, they're just going to rely on selling it, that having the best infrastructure and having it be easy, you, you know, hard to predict, but they're open source and then commercialize it, right? You know, the goal of the new model is to like break OpenAI's dominance because like they're the they're the king. No one can beat GPT four. So like, th they want to create the new uh, Llama two to beat GPT four, right? So it's it's coming, folks, right? And th the present the presentation of the new model is eminent. So I, I don't know the next few months. Hard to predict this stuff. They're going to present it and then hopefully release it. You know, because if I if I could locally run something or you know even rent two A one hundred GPUs, which you can get for. a it doesn't cost that much these days to rent uh, compute on those. Mm -hmm. Then, like to run like local models, I think that'd be so incredibly powerful. And then, like once 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 the open source community gets their hands on GPT four level um, 
quality of an LLM, it's like I think the sky's the limit. We're going to start seeing some real nuts stuff. Cool. I, I, I for one, can't wait. I mean, you know, if you watch this show at all, you know, we're we're big believers in this technology and what it can do. I think, you know, I've heard it said before that people overestimate change in the short term and underestimate change in the long term. And I think yep. I think we're in one of those situations where this technology where like the wild stuff people are talking about that like, oh, and, you know, in a year, like there's going to be no more writers left on Earth. OK, that that's overstated. But in the long run, like this mm-hmm. is really going to change things. Yeah, in, in you know, in, in fifty years, the concept of writing might be different. You know yeah, what it, what it means to write, like might may be a different thing. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely. Know. Um, all right, all right, all right. Some more AI news. So, um, if you haven't actually played with LLMs too much, or like use the API, or like um, use any of the local large language models, you might not know what tokens are. Do you know what tokens are in the context of an LLM, Ryan? Uh, sort of. Okay. So basically, um, the gist of it is a token is basically just um, digested data or information processed so that the, the uh, large language model can use it, right? So a single character could be a token, a, uh, a word could be a token, an entire sentence could be a token. A token is just like computed meaning, essentially, like so computed in, into a form that is meaningful to a large language model, right? Sure. So that's a token. Yep. So this news item is pretty exciting, and now this isn't available yet, so hope in the next year or so this sort of thing will be available. But Microsoft Research introduces LongNet, a transformer variant that can scale sequence length to more than 1 billion tokens with no loss in shorter sequences. Now, if you haven't used the tokens much, you don't might not know what that's a big idea, but um, next slide here. But currently the models, like the, the most performant models, the most number of tokens you can usually get is about 8,000, right? About 8,000 tokens. So using yeah. this new method... Versus 1 billion. Versus 1 billion. Now, <laughs> yeah. this is a research paper, and they say it's not quite ready for the prime time, so we'll see uh-huh. if it really pans out. But, um, no, yeah, that's that's pretty exciting. Like, you know, most models let me do 1,000. Like, so, like, I think of... That when I showed off private, like, private GPT, the super data bot, so if, if you don't know... Uh, anyone listening a few shows ago, like I did a local large language model to like, um, and I fed it all of the transcripts of our show at that time. And we asked it questions and it was pretty cool. Yep. Now, one thing that was limited by was the token limit, right? So I, I, I had to chunk the data into like maybe 500 tokens because locally I could maybe run a thousand or 2000, chunk the data into 500 tokens. Um, then when you search, it would do a semantic search using the, like the embeddings of your text against like the saved token text. And then like, create different chunks and then feed that into one like one prompt and then like analyze that prompt. It wasn't looking at all of our documents. So if, if in order to make a, a, a good salient point, you'd have to look at seven different documents in different locations, you couldn't really do it. If the parameters were a billion, then you could feed it, I don't know, everything I've said in the past three years. Right. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, and have it do an analysis on that. Like the, the scope of that is really... Um, really huge and like how it does it i think is interesting like obviously like i don't understand like the nitty-gritty technical detail but i heard a layman's explanation and i thought it was pretty cool sure right so like the way i looked is like it's it doesn't actually it like it changes focus right so it's not looking at everything at once but it can like zoom in and zoom out much like a human like similar to how a human brain does right Mm -hmm. so if you look at a landscape like at a glance, you can tell this is a landscape and you get a pretty good gist of what you're looking at. There's some mountains, there's some trees, there's a city. But what you can do, like if you zoom in, right? So I don't know, I'm zooming in into the background. I'm like, oh, there's a city. There's a, a couple of tall buildings. Then I zoom back out, right? I now know, I've, I'm not zoomed in anymore, but I know those buildings are there. Or I, I zoom into something on the hillside. It's like, oh, there's a house on the hillside. I zoom in, I zoom back out. So I zoom in and out and like, I'm still keeping track. So now my p- mental picture of it is this entire thing. But I'm zooming in and out, and like after I zoom in, I can see it. And after I zoom out, I still have that knowledge, right? So yeah, my understanding remember. is that I remember it. Like so, it's able to keep context and be able to zoom in and zoom out, like in order to have those a billion tokens, right? And according to the research paper, like this doesn't inf- affect like performance, like or like quality of output. And now, if that's true, and it pans out in a year from now, open source models have a billion tokens. It's like you can feed it every research paper on a given topic and get like and have it make points that are 
I, I, connections that no human could do. Sure. I think this sort of thing is like the first glimmer of like, because right now, large language models, like they don't do anything more than a human can do. They yeah. do it much quicker, right? And enable people to do stuff much quicker. But like, these are things humans can do. Like, if you're able to feed it every piece of knowledge on a topic, that's something a human can't do. Yeah. And then analyze it. Like, that's when you're starting to getting like that, what they call the super AGI or whatever, right? Now, again, like, like you said, Ryan, this is not people underestimate, like, overestimate short term, underestimate long term. In a year, are we going to have super AGI? I, I don't, probably not. In right. 10 years, in 20 years, I don't know. I, I can't see through the veil separating us <laughs> from the future. No one can. Right. You know? Right. So, I thought this was like, when I read about this, I'm like, because this could apply to my own stuff. I'm like, oh, this is super cool. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of what I think about that. Is that, uh, is that the end of our large language update? That's the end of our large language? Uh, I think right. so. That, I don't know. What's the next slide? That has been your large language minute with, uh, with Eric Dolly. Hey, we have a big announcement to make. We, got a, oh. we, we secured a big, uh, a big guest for next week's show. Mm -hmm. At this time, next week, Thursday, July 20th, 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We are going to be interviewing none other than Ben Stansel, Chief Analytics Officer of Mode, recently acquired by ThoughtSpot. This was the big news in the BI industry over the last month, and um, we're thrilled that, that Ben is going to be joining us. Big shout out to Miko Yuk, uh, former guest and friend of the show, for helping to make this happen. And uh, so get your questions in to mm -hmm. us you can email me if you have a question you're dying to ask Ben. Um, you can email me, Ryan, at superdatabrothers.com, and we will do our best to get all of those burning questions answered about uh, Ben's view of the market, the story of mode, the acquisition with ThoughtSpot, how the two mm -hmm. tools will work together going forward. Very interesting time in, in business intelligence, and, uh, and, and this is kind of the, the big thing uh, going on right now. So, like I said... That is next Thursday, July 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Interview yep. with Ben Stansel of Mode and now ThoughtSpot. Really yeah, cool. Get, yeah, get, yeah, get your questions because this is, this is your chance to ask someone who is part, part of like this Mode acquisition, right? Because, Absolutely. Because you get your questions in because we will ask them. Right? And Ben, you know, for, if you don't know Ben, I mean, I would check him out. Like you can just Google him. He has one of the most popular analytics blogs uh, there is. I, I think he has over 12,000 subscribers. He he does really insightful uh posts every friday and he has a really good he has a good writing style you can tell that what he writes was not written by an llm <laughs> <laughs> it's true it is true all right other news uh so august 3rd 10th and 17th the data brothers will be in kenya uh we are going to probably pre-record some shows for those dates but just so that you know uh there might be some programming changes coming up if you catch yeah. us every week, um, you know it's possible that one of these weeks we won't have a show, and this is yep. the reason why we will be in Kenya visiting family. Yep. Yep. Well, well we might try. I don't know. Maybe we can get a uh, go to a net cafe in Nairobi, Nairobi or something. We'll see. We have we have no idea, but yeah, we're we're well, gonna try. We're gonna try to do a live stream uh, from there. But you know, the internet infrastructure in Africa is not um, uh, cannot yeah. always be relied on. All right. Uh, now for Ryan's rant. This is just something I was thinking about the other day. If I, what would be the world's best BI tool? I was thinking about this. Like if I could design uh, the world's best BI tool, what would I put in it? Okay. And this is kind of the list I came up with. Um, and and so the, you know, the first three bullet points you see here really roll up to like, not UI bound. I think one of the problems with the top UI tool or BI tools is that so much of what you can do with them is is really heavily UI bound. They may not have APIs at all, or if they do, they're incomplete. They were an afterthought. They weren't designed API first. Uh, or, you know, there are lots of APIs, but they're not declarative APIs. So, you know, what you in, in, in essence, you can really only make changes to one entity at once. You can't like describe the state of the BI system and have it automatically configure and build itself. Um, and all of this is important because one of the things we believe on this show is that software engineering principles are coming to data. That's obvious. It's already happened. If you look at data engineering, you look at what people do with DBT, right? That's all software engineering principles applied to data, but it, it stops when you get to BI. It's really weird. 
Uh, suddenly you're using the tools and techniques of 2009, right? My ideal BI tool would also serve both what we co traditionally call mode one and mode two. So what does this mean? This means your standard reporting, like I want to have a PDF or an email notification sent out every Monday to a thousand people with their own personal view of the data in a table, right? That's, that's a really classic use case. Lots of people in the tech industry or in startups who I'm friends with say like, nobody does that anymore, do they? Um, but as we'll probably discuss with, with our guest, of, our guest uh, Christoph today, yes, actually lots of people still do that, right? Um, and then there's mode two, which is kind of the self-service Power BI Tableau thing. Now, it would do these two, plus we're on the cusp of something. Maybe mode three is coming soon. Maybe it's LLM driven. I don't know. But it would for sure combine these two things, right? Query optionality. Some BI tools are built on a model of we send SQL to your database. Other BI tools are built on a model of you extract the data and load it into some kind of file, a hyper file or something like that. And even when they do both, oftentimes they were first designed for one and they're much better at that one, right? I would like a tool that can do both of these things really well and give you really great control over when and how to go to the database versus use the cache or combine live results with cache results, right? Give me the tooling to manage that. Of course, an open semantic layer, we've had how many semantic layer guests on the show? Uh, you go look at um, uh, three or four, know, maybe. I don't know. Inacella or Elif Tutuk, right? We this, this is like a one of our favorite topics. We think it's so important to have a semantic layer, especially if you're you help plan on getting doing AI stuff, right? Like you're not going to build AI going against the raw tables. Let me tell you, you need a semantic layer to get uh, to get anything out of your LLM. Otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. And a flexible front end, not just dashboards. We had Ali Hughes on from Count, and uh, that's a great tool. You know, if you want the <laughs> probably the most flexible BI front end imaginable, Count is that tool. But my ideal tool would combine all of these things into one product, and it would be a big, beautiful platform and not a little point solution that you would integrate into the modern data stack. And I, I've just been thinking about this a lot lately. And uh, I, I felt like doing a little rant on it. I feel like if I had all these things as an analytics engineer, like I, I could really do a lot of damage uh, in a good way, uh, uh, you know, with this feature set, managing it all with code, doing CI, CD, like you could just build and iterate so quickly, have code control, auditability, right? Deploy in an afternoon, all that great stuff with a great feature set. So uh, hopefully someone builds one of these things one of these days. Uh, and if, you know, what I would encourage you is like, look for tools that have these features and, uh, uh, and go to your BI vendor and say, Hey, what are your plans for this stuff? Right. Show me your roadmap. Can you do these things? Because this is where the future is, especially when you consider that large language models operate on language tools that are language based. Okay. Tools where you can do anything in the BI tool using an API by writing code. They are going to have a huge advantage. Uh, because of LLMs versus tools that are UI bound. That is something I fundamentally believe. All right, Ryan's rant, done. And we'd like to pause a moment. We're going to bring Christoph on in just a second, but let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Symphony. You can see them at Symphony Analytics IO. Are you still building slide decks with static screenshots taken from your dashboards? Well, stop it. Symphony Analytics crushes that life-draining task by pulling your best content from Power BI, Tableau Click, and more into an integrated storytelling canvas with no migrations needed. That's the beauty of it. You know, we talked in an earlier episode about what a nightmare uh, migrating BI tools is. It's one of the beauties of Symphony. You can combine things from all these places in a single canvas with no migrations needed. You can annotate, narrate, and rapidly share insights without all of those time-sucking slide deck builds and empower your audience to share rapid feedback on Symphony's cloud solution. So no local install, you can get started really quickly. What Symphony does is it takes your BI silos and transforms them into unified, powerful stories that makes finding your best content easy. So visit them at symphonyanalytics.io today to connect your data, save money on migrations, those brutal, brutal BI migrations, and bring analytics collaboration to the people. That is symphonyanalytics.io. 
Io, and we want to thank them uh, for their sponsorship of today's stream. Our very first sponsor. How exciting! All right, um, and actually, um, they will be a guest on the show in a, in a couple of weeks. So tune in for that as well. All right, now I think the preamble is done. It's time for our interview. Get ready, everybody, to bring the one, the only TM fanboy, Christoph Hein, onto the Super Data Show. Christoph, welcome. Hi, right, welcome. Hi, Great guys. To have you. Nice to be here. Yeah. Greetings uh, from Germany. Yeah, that's. Uh, I say we have a, an international uh, audience <laughs> out there. It's it's uh, it's it's really cool to have you. Um, so, you bill yourself as the TM1 fanboy. Why don't you give everybody a little introduction yeah. to yourself and what you're all about? Okay, I will try. Hi, I'm Christoph. I'm I've worked with Team One for the last. 12 years, so I started right after university, after I finished my master's degree in modern history, and then I directly <laughs> switched into IT. Absolutely. <laughs> uh -huh. The best way to do it. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I started because I was young and needed the money. I started as a business intelligence consultant for a small uh, company in Germany, and that's the first time I, I came in contact with TM1, and my at first I was a bit... Uh, yeah, it, 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 feels, it felt strange compared to other tools back then, but uh, I quickly um, un uncovered uh, the power of it and have worked with it ever since and built my whole career around it. So it felt only naturally after a couple of years to, to show that <laughs> to the rest of the world. And um, I think right when, when COVID hit, I started to to post more stuff on, on LinkedIn. And uh, I somehow came up with the moniker of Team One Fanboy. And the, rest, the rest is history. I now work, uh, most of the time I work for Deutsche Bahn. It's the largest Team One customer in the world. So the only fitting place for the Team One Fanboy to work. <laughs> absolutely. Um, absolutely. And besides that, as a side project, I maintain the uh, IBM Planning Analytics uh, Ecosystem Guide by Bark. That's a... Uh, German research firm, um, Germany-based research firm. So check it out on planninganalyticsguide.com. Yeah. And besides that, uh, that's me. If you have any questions, feel free. <laughs> yeah, as we go through, uh, remember, of course, this is a live show. We don't pre-record yeah. this. Yeah. And so get your questions into the chat. We got a couple uh, regulars uh, from Deutschland showing out today. So we got uh, Jens Baumler and Martin Otto uh, saying hello. Um, good friends uh, of ours from the Cognos community. And so um, why don't you tell us a little bit, so, so for anybody who's watching who maybe isn't like, isn't familiar with TM1 or doesn't, hasn't heard of it before, can you give us a kind of a, a background on this technology? Where does it come from and what does it really do? Uh, okay. Yeah. TM1 is, it, if you first look it up, it, it seems like an old technology because uh, it was uh, invented in the 80s by Manny Perez. And he came up with this super powerful and super flexible uh, OLAP engine to to do planning and analytics stuff, because uh, he back then he worked at Exxon, Exxon, and they couldn't just he couldn't uh, get his financial data right. So he 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 thought about it and he he developed Team One, and from from that on. It was a huge success, and then it was acquired by 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 Applix 1996, and then it was acquired by by Cognos. So it's maybe for you, it's maybe it's as well uh, an emotional <laughs> emotional topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, when uh, IBM acquired Cognos, it came uh, to IBM. But it's uh, I think every major company in the world. He uses uses team one has used team one for decades and all the other I think one of the things I most like about it it's it's a piece of software that's been there for and it uh, and all the competitors came and they're all gone like all the then you when you look up stuff uh, competitors in the 90s all those companies are gone they don't exist anymore the technology is gone and team one is still there and it's I think from the bottom of my heart I think that will be true for a modern BI stack as well. It will all 
uh, come to pass and team one will still be there and it's just the most flexible and scalable solution it's it's unrivaled in, in its scalability i've never encountered any business problem i couldn't handle with team one yeah i can i can, I can tell you um you know eric and i used to work for a pretty yeah. a pretty big uh, ibm analytics consulting partner here in the united states and uh, we had a client very large rideshare client who i guarantee mm -hmm. you've heard of that um that you that used tm1 and i think it gets to your point christoph of, of like you may think of oh it was developed in the 80s and like so much of what we talk about has been developed in the last five or seven years yeah. and so this must be old technology used by old firms and that's not the case at all no definitely not uh, when you you when i um read your 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 bullet points on your ryan's rent list i think uh, team one can check a couple of those boxes there's a very modern REST API. It's a OData uh, standard. It follows the OData standard, four I think 4.0 or 4.1 or uh, something in the fourth. Um, so it uh, has a modern API where you can read and write and access all the data and you can <clears throat> pull the data out. You can load data into it via an API. It has a Git integration, so you can... It's not, it's not perfect yet, but they are working on... Um, integrating it into a CI CD pipeline um, where you can do some really like deploy your model and do automated testing, etc. So it's it is it has been around for a while, but it's uh, constantly modernized, and IBM is heavily investing in it. Um, maybe not always advertising it, yeah, <laughs> as, 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 as good as it could be advertised, yeah, but uh. They are still in, in investing in it, and it's um, now completely lost what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have we have a question here from uh, Chris Tab. Um, you know, ha have you ever? Did we ever get to use Power Play? And I can say, like, I used Power Play. I did. My, not. my whole early career was built on Power Play. Like, I, I nope. actually was. Um, I was looking for. So we're going to Kenya, and in order to get in to the country, you need a, um, you need to show proof of your yellow fever vaccination. Mm -hmm. and so I was looking up my yellow fever vaccination card in this box of old documents I have. And I pulled out these, these, uh, power play, like expert guides that I had printed in, in maybe 2008 or something like that in order to, uh, to, um, that, like, cause they, IBM released some really awesome power play guides back then that sort of got lost they got really hard to find and so when mm -hmm. i did find them i printed them all out so i'd have a physical copy then i remember uh i think the assumption for a long time was like ibm was going to uh was going to add like like they would have you know that would be the integration point people thought was like oh tm1 are, is going to replace power play cubes and like you know the power play front end might have a tm1 back end but that the integration between Cognos and TM1 oh. that we assumed would happen never it was never really that strong, was it? No, not not really. It's uh, it hardly <clears throat> hardly happened. I think as well. so. So to answer the question, I never used PowerPlay. I've I've never used Cognos Analytics or anything uh, from the Cognos stack. Um, and people, all, <laughs> I think the funny thing is people who are newer to the TM1 world, like for doing it for the last five five years or something like that. I, I had a couple of uh, AMAs with IBM where people started to ask the question, when will, um, because it seems like uh, natural to to combine TM1 planning analytics and Cognos analytics to combine it. So people who are new to this world ask wh wh if they will do it and when it will happen. And all, all of us old timers are laughing because they tried and failed. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember... Um that rideshare company like there was the, there was the new um planning analytics connector right and like we were using it and like it just had a bunch of problems yeah right yeah. so yeah it's, it's just it's still it just better than work. the connector between uh, tableau and team one or power bi and team one but uh it's uh it's not hard to be better than that because there <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, i think the, uh so we have a uh, well. Go ahead yeah, and finish your question. point, and then, yeah, and then we will address I, the question. Quickly, should I quickly answer it? it? No, they don't. Yeah, go go for it. They, yeah, they, yeah. So yeah, they, the answer is no. <laughs> it does not scale uh, horizontally, um, and 
they plan on, on, on they, they always tell about that they are planning on doing it. But I think it's it's not that easy because uh, of the whole how, how the system is built <clears throat> because it's an in-memory database and it's everything is connected because you have no no limitations of connecting your cubes. You can have like 50 cubes in your database and you can connect them all live in real time with, with rules. So I think it can get pretty complex to to scale that horizontally. But they say they are planning to do it. That kind of leads into another question, which is, um, uh, so it kind of piggybacks off of that, which is, you know, the, the deployment models for, for TM1, has it been containerized? Can you run it on Kubernetes yet? Or is that still in flight? No, uh, you, you, yes and no. <laughs> As a, because uh, you can, uh, the new version V12, it's all containerized. It's all OpenShift, Kubernetes, uh, it has failover, high availability, all this modern cloud stuff, and it's. Uh, but it only runs on IBM on IBM Cloud and on uh, on AWS, but mm -hmm. as a service. So for and I, I've heard rumors. I don't know, but I've heard rumors like eighty or ninety percent are still on-premise customers, yeah. deploying it on their own infrastructure, made in the maybe in the cloud as an on a cloud machine, but still maintain it themselves. So. Uh, the, those people are so far cannot de use uh, Kubernetes, but they I see, they, they recently announced uh, that they will bring this to uh, on-premise customers as well, and you can do it on Kubernetes. And you have, I think, that so far what I've heard. But I, when I when I uh, look at the uh, chat, I see some people like Ryan Clapp, who maybe knows more about V12 than I do. But um, so far, it has some some nice technical advantages which i personally don't think most customers need because uh, it's, it's it's for I, I have a hard time um thinking that a bi system needs high availability that it doesn't it doesn't need 99.99% availability it's a strategic tool it's not an operational tool so that solves a problem a lot, lot of customers don't have. That, but that's my take on it. It's, it's a tool which uh, helps you uh, make decisions. And those decisions are most of the time, they're not real time decisions. Like you have to, to decide in like five minutes to go left or right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess that's a, that's a good point. You know, um, it's not like uh, like a like a web server that needs to scale horizontally like across the globe with like sub millisecond response times. This is it's like an analytics engine, yeah. right? So like and plus you know a lot of um, I've been reading like you know people write articles about everything, but people have been writing articles about like oh distributed's gone now it's back to the single machine power super powerful machine because machines yes. are so freaking powerful now, you right. know. For a while, we needed to scale out, but for some stuff, like in analytics, sometimes you just need one big, beefy machine, and it'll do a lot of the stuff you need. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's what Team One does really good, because you can put it on a, on a single server, give it like terabytes of memory, and it, I've, I once had a discussion with an IBM engineer who said, in theory, there is no limit. So there is no artificial limit of the amount of memory the machine can use. So you will get I think the biggest machine you can get on AWS is like 16 terabyte or something, or 12 terabyte. So in theory, Team One can scale up to this, and the same goes for the amount of of, of cores of CPUs. You, can use. you will get the system will get slower and slower uh, as it grows because you have um, like some um, management overhead to to manage the whole system. But in in theory, it, it has no limit. Like other tools have limits, like uh, one gigabyte or one terabyte of data is too much and I know of, of, of Team One single service systems which have like four or five terabyte of RAM memory. That's wild. <laughs> and then that's, they are working crazy. They, they, they can use it and they use it to for a couple of thousand uh, users and they just, you know, they all enter data at the same time. They just write data into it. And then and this whole system all, uh, instantly in real time aggregates this data and uses it to uh, compute uh, new KPIs, et cetera. That's, yeah. I think that's so amazing. 
That's an important thing to note that um, anybody who's watching who's not familiar with TM1 and is thinking, okay, this is some kind of like in-memory database. Like, yeah, that, that's one way to think about it, but um, it has that real-time write-back capability that separates it from from other OLAP solutions that that we used to use, like PowerPlay or analysis services cubes or that sort of thing. Right back in analysis services. Oh, I did this for a couple of times. That's horrible. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, and exactly. Then, and yeah, and you can you have um, your whole business logic. You can build an application, a model with uh, with an integrated business logic. So you enter a value and a couple of uh, KPIs depending on this uh, of this measure, they change instantly. For, and then it aggregates to the whole uh, a group result or, or something like that. And it's just in real time. So you don't have to press a button or anything. And that's, uh, I think that's uh, amazing, the, the scale on which Team One can do. It. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen that in action. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, I've been involved in some Cognos projects that had TM1 as a backend that had some pretty insane data volumes. And, and we still had the ability to, to do, um, not through the Cognos interface, of course, because as we've, as we've discussed, that junction is not great. But it's, it's not through, terrible. Through TM1, you know, or people going in and doing write back and that sort of thing. Um, so we've kind of got that. We've been talking about TM1, the kind of the, the database. I'll just use that term. Um, but there's also the front end question. And so here's, here's a, a LinkedIn users asks, does anybody actually like planning analytics workspace? Could you explain what planning analytics workspace is? And, and maybe a little bit about like TM one's not just a database. It has a front end too. So what, what's the story there? Um, okay. Let's maybe, uh, go back in time for that because TM one was there before Excel was around. So the first version of TM1 has its own spreadsheet um, front end, and then Excel came around and Lotus one two three and that stuff, and they and it so it, it historically it's always been strong with Excel with uh, spreadsheets, um, and that's why people in finance love it because it's it just seamlessly integrates in your spreadsheets, and over the years and the, so in the I think it was the early two thousands. Uh, this uh, this browser thing came up and came, became very popular. So people were like, "Ah, we don't want to spread have spreadsheets anymore. We we need this in a, in a, in a web browser because we, then we don't have to install it, etc." So they invented, uh, and I'm uh, let's go. Uh, let's say they invented Team One Web. So it's a web interface where you could upload your spreadsheets. That was I think was the early two thousands, maybe early two thousand ten. Um. And that were the front ends you you had, and it was good for the time. It was very functionality was good and everything, but uh, then tools like Tableau and Click came around, and they had this beautiful dashboards, and everyone loved it because it looked so beautiful. Um, and then it was around the same time IBM acquired Team One, and then they tried to mix it up with, with Cognos, and then uh, they, they, they mm -hmm. had this whole bunch of, of, of tools no one remembers nowadays because no one, <laughs> none, of, them, none mm -hmm. of those got real traction, like performance model or tier one uh, applications and all this, this stuff. Um, so that it took them a couple of years to figure out dashboards. And then in 20... I will say 15 or 16, they came around with a new web-based dashboarding uh, tool. It's called Planning Analytics Workspace because at the same time they started to rebrand Team One to Planning, Al Planning Analytics. And it's a web-based uh, dashboarding tool where you can create dashboards in a, in a, in a web by a web interface, and you can still up your, upload your uh, spreadsheets. Um, and you can have reports where you have a dashboard and uh, next to it, you have a, a small spreadsheet in a browser. And that's, uh, and it took them a while to, to, to be honest, to figure it out. But nowadays, I think it's uh, works to answer the initial question. Workspace is a, it's a pretty good tool to, to build dashboards on, on top of team one. And it's a dashboarding tool, but you still have the capability to, 
to enter data. So you have a dashboard and you can enter data into your dashboard. It will change the KPIs in your dashboard and you can still have your, your workflows for your planning application uh, combined with a dashboard. So, so nowadays I think it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty neat. And the great thing about Team One is it's, it's a database and you have a front end provided by IBM, but you have also third party tools like, uh, um, which is a Team One connector like Excel cubed or the good old executive viewer, which is rebranded nowadays to something service web performance, I think. And you have, uh, Applico UX, you have uh, Virtuality, Mosaic, and a, couple, a bunch of, and my old employer, my first employer, Cubeware, if you know them, Cubeware Cockpit. All those different tools uh, allow uh, to, to build, uh, to use your Team 1 data and have a good connector to Team 1, maybe a better one than even Cognos Analytics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that that's one of the challenges I always found with TM1, at least when I worked with TM1 people and, and TM1 customers, it's just the struggle of like, okay, which user interface should we use for this, right? Like, do we want to use Workspace? Do we want to use the, um, they used to call it the, what was the Excel plugin called back in the day? Perspectives. Uh, yeah, right. Do we want to use that? Do we want to fix for Excel? Yeah. Yeah. There was always just a big, a big um, question about that. So um, we got another question. This, uh, uh, Yatsik and friend of the show, Jeff Smacks, uh, both asking about, um, can you elaborate more about like, how is the data stored in the memory? Like, is it, is it similar to any of the open source standard formats like Parquet or Arrow? Is this columnar, you know, the pretty technical okay. question here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, there is a YouTube video from, uh, Hubert Hakers. It's a chief architect for the team one server. And he explains that, uh, pretty good. It's, uh, it's uh, with with a uh, it's stored as a try. It's a uh, I don't really. It's it's not column based. It's not uh, tabular or anything. It's it's uh, like a graph. Ah, that's but that's uh, that's where it gets for me. I recommend this video because uh, <laughs> I, I watched it a couple of times and then I, I always I listen to the video and I watch the video and I'm like okay yeah now I get it now. It totally makes sense how Team One stores data and why it's so perform so fast and as everything, and then asked me two days later and I was like, yeah, I, I remember it sounded really straightforward, but I can't remember. I can't. I can't explain. <laughs> it so, so it's it's a bunch of math wizardry basically. Yeah. <laughs> so what's what was that YouTube video? Maybe we can uh, we can post it in the chat will, for um, people. I will uh, look it up and give you. Yeah. Uh, but, Eric, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead and look that up. Eric, I'll just read a couple of comments while you're doing that. Um, so we've, we've got this one from uh, Cognos Paul Mendelssohn. So he mentions that he wrote a system in TM1 that allows users to post comments to TM1 tuples. That's a or technical tuple. term there, tuples. Uh, tuple, the great uh, debate. That, that's that's a, like a tomato-tomato sort of thing, I think. Uh -huh. um, to tuples as a text measure, which he can then pull through the REST API. So that's, that's pretty interesting uh, you, on you, its own. You can, uh, I posted the uh, link in the chat. I think I cannot post comments, but I can post it in yeah, the chat. Look, um, and the, the, that's, that's the one thing that's very good about Team One as well. You can store text, you can store comments because it's a planning tool. So you can comment on entries there. You can build a whole application with a workflow around it. Like you enter uh, as a, as uh, you 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 as you enter your data your planning data and your your, your numbers and then you click a button and your superior sees the data and uh, goes no that's now we cannot we cannot use those numbers and he and he or she writes a comment and presses a button and goes back to you so uh, yeah we dropped uh, very powerful. We dropped the um, the comment into both uh, YouTube and LinkedIn, and then here it is for those of you who prefer the uh, the human touch of manually copying it using <laughs> eyeballs and fingers. Um, okay, um, so what? Let me ask you: like, what is the? Uh, let, let's shift a little bit and talk about. Um, we kind of talk about the history of TM1, you know, what it is, why it's powerful. I, I don't know if you remember this number, but I just reiterate the scale that you can do with this thing. I think it was Ancestry.com put out a white paper where they were doing, they had what, like 47 billion or 47 trillion intersections in a TM1 cube or something like that. I mean, it was like, 
some insane number. Um, so, mm, so theoretically, a cube can have up to two hundred and fifty-six dimensions. Yeah. So I once, for fun, I tried it. I built a cube with that many dimensions. That's. I think I think the usability goes down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, um, that's uh, and 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 one dimension can I think have up to two billion elements, so you know two billions uh, and then two hundred fifty six dimensions. That's the number of intersections in theory you can uh, you can have. Uh, uh, and then of of course it's not not all of them. Those are filled with numbers, mm -hmm. but uh, that's theoretically the scale you 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 have available <clears throat> and yeah it's it's really crazy <laughs> how much you can get into one of these things um yeah but it's uh still it's uh historically team one doesn't store zeros people always confuse it that it does team one does not allow for null values but technically it doesn't store zeros so it's always null, but displayed as a zero. So, but that uh, poses a couple of problems when you explicitly want to have a zero in a cube. But otherwise, it's at um, the sparsity. It's uh, the it's always a lot of sparsity in those cubes. So the, the theoretical number of intersections is nothing compared. It's much much larger than the actually um, filled intersections. Right. Yeah. So let's, um, so let's, uh, talk a little bit about, so who, like, who, what is the, what are some of the use cases for TM1? Like, what are people actually doing with it out there in the wild and what sort of companies are using it today? Is this strictly very large companies solving very large problems? And, and what are those problems? Um, I, I assume it's, mid to large companies smaller ones mostly go for smaller solutions which um like you can get a, a long way with excel and access to be to be honest so uh um and and there are other um maybe tools which uh, which have a nicer user interface maybe more accessible so smaller companies, I think, rarely use Team One because its power, its its scalability, and its flexibility. So um, that's why it, it's especially interesting for larger companies because you don't have to um, change your process processes to accommodate your tool. Team One, because of its flexibility, you can all your business processes um, fit into Team One because it's so flexible. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it um, will bend to you. You do not have to bend to it. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's uh, that's uh, exactly. And um, we, I, I've seen and I, from from my personal experience and from what I've talked about with people, is of course it's very strong in the finance department. That's yeah. it's historically strong, um, especially planning. But uh, I see a lot of use cases. Uh, um, in HR, so where it's very good for workforce strategic workforce planning because you can do great things like, um, again, because of the flexibility you can have for like your next eighteen months, you have a very detailed uh, planning on a on a individual level, like per person. Like this this guy is going uh, is going to retire in six months, and this one is going into maternal or paternal leave or etc. Very detailed level. And you can have the same cube. You can use the same cube to go for like the next five years. You go to switch to a driver-based planning where you enter like a percentages of, of people who are going to quit or you, who are going to retire, etc. And you can have this all in the same model and you have a seamless um, process, a planning process, because the next 18 months you have a very detailed, you enter in your very detailed numbers and then you just, you know, maybe do it in for usability on, on, on another report, you, you open another, another sheet and then you enter your drivers. And um, that that allows for uh, enormous flexibility. And uh, you can also, also combine the data. You can extract the data from your uh, HR system 
and uh, export it easily to your finance finance system for to, so you have your headcount in in your finance system for um, to to plan your costs of, of labor etc. And uh, it's IBM is heavily investing and promoting it for sustainability. And I think it's a great tool in the field of sustainability, because if you go uh, talking about circular economy and stuff like that, or um, supply chain, what's the name? Supply chain, uh, uh, supply chain management for for um, and you have like your second or third tier supply, and you you have your system, and you're like, okay, this one um, is is. Uh, Getting its its raw materials from a, a mine in in, in in Congo where they use child labor, etc. What what will happen if I change that supplier? If I don't um, use this supplier anymore, and how will will, will this affect my whole um, my whole process? How how will it affect my my um, my company? This you can simulate with easily with with TM1. So there it's uh, it's uh, things that's very cool use cases there. And of course, you can use it in general for procurement, for supply chain, for for any stuff, logistic stuff like planning uh, your uh, how you um, put together your your cargo trains, for example, and to simulate everything you want to simulate and and you require which requires user input. Yeah, we've got a comment from Paul here. He, he says, you know, supply versus demand, cost, indirect, uh, indirect, indirect versus revenue funnel, process conversion, like so many use cases. And I think um, where I've seen it been really powerful is is like you use the word simulation. And I think that that like once you set up TM1 and you get all, you know, you get your data in there, you get your rules set up and that sort of thing, you're, you're in a situation where you really can very easily change numbers, swap out suppliers, say, you know, what if the price of oil goes up 20%? What if it goes down 20%? It like recalculates all those things pretty much instantaneously. Yeah, and you can have multiple scenarios where you just switch, uh, change a couple of, of your drivers or something like that. And I think that's that's always what I would tell people. It's everywhere um, where you are making decisions in your company, you can use Team One because... Most BI tools only do the analytics part. Yeah. And then I always ask people, okay, now, now you have your dashboard and you see your revenue is going down, but what now? How, yeah. how will you, what's your next step? So I will say you, you need a planning tool. And you, if you have a, if you have planning, you, the next thing you need is, as you said, simulation, because planning is entering one set of numbers, but I don't want to add, enter one set of numbers. I want to see, I want to, I want to have alternatives. I want to have different scenarios because if I have different alternatives, I then it's the only uh, time when I can make a decision. I have to choose between alternatives, then I can make a decision. And that's that's uh, the thing we, we need to do in business. Everyone has to make decisions. And then you can enter, you, you can decide for, um, for, for a scenario, you can decide which scenario you're going to choose. And then you can, it then comes full circle because then you can um, do your actuals versus plan uh, with your versus budget, and you can um, iterate your your planning process. And you can see, okay, we did not uh, hit our our goals. Why is that? So maybe we have to tweak the process, and then you can. It comes full circle. And you have your new actuals, and you go into the next planning cycle. Simulate a couple of different scenarios. Decide which scenario you're going to follow, and then you go actual versus budget again and the whole process over and over again and most other tools just do one part of the process or maybe two yeah that's really i think too like with where we are in in the analytics and business intelligence world right now like the i've seen this in practice you know the era of being able to walk into the the c-suite and just show them an amazing dashboard and have them be like, oh, this is so cool. Like, that's kind of over. Yeah. Like they they see the amazing dashboard and then go, that's very nice. What am I supposed to do about this? Yeah. Right. Um, and so that that like that's a shift in uh, a shift in in what you need to be able to provide to decision makers. Right. You can't just give them the pretty picture anymore. It's not yeah. satisfying like it was, you know, in 2015. Tableau was so like gives just showing someone a Tableau dashboard. They were like, this is so amazing looking like, thank you so much for this. It's, 
now I can see these five KPIs in one place, right? But um, instead, now they say, great, what's next? Uh, yeah. and, and, and having a tool like this, I mean, it just gives you the ability to model that out. Okay, what if we try this? What if we try that? What if we try this other thing? Here are the three scenarios. Which one do you want to pick, right? What, yeah. what should we do? Um, yeah. So uh, l let me ask you, there's just one more kind of technical question, and then we're almost out of time. I, I did want to talk to you about a few other things uh, while I have you. Just get, how can you integrate ML models and algorithms into TM1 rules to improve like the rule-based forecast? So what, like, do you have any recommendations for this person about how to how to integrate the kind of an AI forecast as opposed yeah, to just yeah, when, rules uh, how 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 you do it with with most other tools as well you use Python because Simple it has answer. a REST API where you can read and write so you can um, and we've done a couple of those projects and there's now a um, couple of more there's this really great um, package for Python called Team One Pi it's really awesome. And it allows allows you to easily connect and retrieve your data from TM1 into a pandas data frame, for example. Do your, I always say, do your data science voodoo with it. Yeah, <laughs> have, uh -huh. have, have have a new have have a new column in your data frame or something like that, and then just push it back in. That's uh, that's uh, the flexibility of TM1. They don't have to provide um, their own machine learning model because there is there is this whole bunch of stuff you can do with with python which is always better than what some a single company can provide for a single tool absolutely okay that um that is the the, the answer right like python <laughs> yeah um yeah. so we just have a few minutes left i, I want to go back a little bit to the beginning of our conversation and just hit on um you know you didn't study this right and uh and neither did i i was a theater major you studied history so you know how did what was that transition like? And, and do you have any advice for people who are looking to get into the analytics industry who, who didn't study it and, and like don't come from a mathematics or computer science background? Like, do you have any advice for them on, on how to make this transition? Uh, that's, that's hard. I've, I've, I've thought about this a lot. Um, what, how, how? Because we have, uh, of course, a shortage of qualified labor in Germany, for example, and we are looking for, especially in the field of Team One, it's hard to to find. There, there's just a limited amount of senior Team One developers and consultants available. Um, so we are thinking we are at Deutsche Bahn, for example, we are trying to train new people, and we are always thinking about who to pick because um, if you you uh, if you hire someone who studied uh, computer science. Those people see Team One and just you know run away screaming, because they say we want to do machine learning, we want to do AI, we want to do uh, I don't know whatever fancy technology is on vogue at the moment. Um, so, so you don't get those, and you go for the business people, um, and those most of those have problem you know understanding uh, the technology, um, and because you have to constantly uh, um, unlearn what you've learned and to relearn new stuff and you have always um, you have to be very good in acquiring knowledge and uh, working with um, unfamiliar subject and then people who studied humanities come in because that's basically what you learn there yeah <laughs> i don't know how it was for you but i think i expect it was similar when i when I studied, they I had to write papers, and then they were like, "Here's a topic." Uh, I, I remember uh, once I got the assignment to write about a uh, woman in the Roman upper class, Christian woman in the Roman upper class in the early uh, in the first two centuries. Something I've ne I didn't even know that this is a thing back then. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I had to start digging into it and have to had to read up on that stuff and had to learn about it and it's but it's by the way it's a very fascinating story um and i had to figure out the whole whole the whole topic and that's uh something you learn in in, in those uh in those uh major as you major in, in humanities you learn to to embrace the unknown and learn new stuff 
and acquire new knowledge and really dig deep into a certain topic. And that's um, that's the best qualification, I would say, for, for working in data analytics or in its whole field because it's true for the technology, it's true for the subjects. You have to always find a new... For example, now I'm, I'm learning a lot about sustainability because of, I'm involved in a couple of sustainability projects and I have to read up on that stuff and have to learn about it because it, this this wasn't even a topic 20 years ago yeah 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 i i, I mean it's i i just agree 100 with what you said right like the stuff i studied in the humanities i you know sometimes people will ask me like i, I think i did a linkedin post recently like if you want to become people are always talking about business value lately right there's been this pivot to business value it's not enough to just be a great data engineer and write amazing SQL, right? You need to, you need to identify business value and deliver business value. And it's like, how, how do you do that? Right. I, I would not read a book about business value uh, necessarily as the only thing I do. Although friend of the show, Chris tab is writing one. So do read Chris's book. But um, uh, I would like, like you, I, I tell people like read some literature, right? Learn yeah. what other people, what makes people think, what compels them. How do yeah. you solve their problems, right? Yeah. How do they frame their problems? How do you identify their, like fiction can teach you that, right? In a way that like a step-by-step a -step book on like how to understand people, like is not, yeah. it'll give you some, it'll give you tips and strategies, but but it, it's not just up here when you're dealing with people. It comes from in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true as well. It's a people business, definitely. Yeah, and that's, data, that's you know, if you get into the tech field, like data more than anything that's what attracted me to it when I was looking at, you know, do I want to go into an analytics uh, after I had given up the dream of, of uh, being a director and a playwright um, analytics are like networking, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's like analytics is the people part of, of our industry. And that's why I chose. It. Yeah. So true. Cool. Okay. Well, we are, uh, we are out of time here, Christoph. This was an amazing conversation thank you so much for for coming on the show where can people find you on linkedin <laughs> christoph hein on linkedin yes. the tm1 fanboy feel free to add me on linkedin i'm always happy to connect always happy to have conversations about team one or about humanities <laughs> absolutely <laughs> or, uh, uh christian uh, upper class women in the first two centuries yeah of, uh, yeah that's uh -huh. a, i maybe have to read up on that again because uh, <laughs> it's like 15 years ago but <laughs> awesome yeah. all right oh, I'm, I'm up for a discussion about this as well great uh well, thanks again for coming on the show christoph it was great to have you thanks for having me it was really fun yeah yeah great show thank i think i cut him off there all right um hey this what a what a great uh what yeah. a great conversation awesome show to have today let me just um one more time before we uh we leave let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about today's sponsor uh that is symphony analytics you can find them at symphonyanalytics.io look the beautiful thing about symphony analytics is that you can combine the output from multiple bi tools into a single interface that is not just about putting them together there are lots of vendors that make a tool with that is focused on give me this dashboard and this dashboard in a single catalog okay that's not what this is about what this is about is giving you all those the the analytics output in a single catalog and then giving you the collaboration tools on top of it to actually tell a story to combine data from tableau and power bi into a single story and stop screenshotting uh your visualizations out of your out of three bi tools to put them into one slide deck it sucks we've all done it don't do it anymore go to symphonyanalytics.io and check it out um any final words for the people eric no, uh, just thanks everyone for for tuning in. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and like and subscribe. All that jazz uh, yes, helps please. the show. And if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to uh, connect with any of us, uh, and we'll connect back. And if you ever want to chat, we'll be happy to chat back too. I would say uh, well, the last thing people do ask me: Hey, I missed the show. Where can I see it? Look, we simultaneously live stream to both LinkedIn and YouTube, and the show yep. is always available on demand on YouTube. So check it out, youtube.com slash cc slash superdatabrothers. That will take you to the channel. From there, you mm -hmm. can see all the content that we've made and go ahead and give us a like and a thumbs up. And um, and then yep. last thing, let's not forget 
next week, big, 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 big show. This is the probably the in, in terms of uh, you know, yeah, fame this is the most famous person we've ever had on the show. Uh-huh. We're really excited to have him. Ben Stansel of Mode, recently acquired by Thought Spot next Thursday, July 20th, uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern data uh daylight time data time, <laughs> data time. eastern, it's it's eastern data, time. data time here baby um, <laughs> east, eastern daylight time uh bring your questions uh because big news in the industry mode plus thought spot one of the leading data analyst focus tools with the leading nlg nlq focus tool coming together very interesting times um, we look forward to talking to ben and thank him for agreeing to join us so uh with that i am ryan I am Eric. And this has been the Super Data Brothers Show. We'll see you next week, everybody. All right. See you. Bye.